Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Well, hello, welcome back. And today, John Coleman, my partner, and I are speaking with the virtual gourmet, John Mariani. How are you doing, John and John? I am well, both of us. John, you look well. And you look like you're preparing for the season's Nouvelle Beaujolais. Oh, I am so giddy. <laughs> so, so every year, every year, there's this big deal about... The other is Beaujolais Nouvelle release, and I don't know which one I'm more excited about. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to ask about. I, there's this category that you've mentioned in the past called seasonal wines, and I'm not sure what seasonal wines really are or whether Beaujolais Nouvelle, because I've, I've had Beaujolais and I remember many years ago getting excited, oh, the new Beaujolais, but but I, I thought it was all hype afterwards, you know, and so every year I still enjoy a good Beaujolais, but I don't think it's a big deal. It, uh, put me in perspective here. Is Beaujolais, the fact that they make a, a, a big deal out of it, the new vintage coming out every year, is that a... Is that a real thing? Well, it's certainly a real thing. They used to sell oceans full of Beaujolais. Um, first of all, the, the idea that they are seasonal wines, there's no reason why you can't drink white wines in the winter and <clears throat> red wines in the summer. Um, but there are wines that seem better fit during a season, like maybe in the middle of summer in July, you're just on a steak on the, on the grill. You want a big red Cabernet Sauvignon from California with that. And, uh, in the, in the, and, and uh, you might, if you're having salmon and a nice Pinot Noir, so um, you can drink anything you want all year long. But there are, are wines that go better with various seasons for various reasons, not least of which is that they come out seasonally. Um, First of all, the, the uh, wine market kind of has two seasons. They release a lot of new stuff in the fall, including wines that were from the vintage 2019. Um, now they were released the 2019s in fall of 2020. And then in the spring, they will release a good deal more, um, including some of the young 2020s, um, but wines that have been hanging out in their cellars for two, three, four, five years and they're ready to be released. Uh, and the spring is a big time for wine sales. So is, so obviously is, um, is Christmas time. Now back to Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, nobody really heard of such a thing because there wasn't such a thing except in the Beaujolais region in France and Burgundy where Beaujolais is made, or the Gamay grape. And uh, Beaujolais in itself is not considered one of the great Burgundies, but a great Beaujolais if it's aged um, for six months, a year, two years, is a wonderful, wonderful wine. Um, like, l l as good as uh, many, many uh, of the lesser Burgundy, certainly, and much, much cheaper. So I highly recommend, if you go to the wine store, to buy an aged Beaujolais. But what is Beaujolais Nouveau? Well, the, um, the term means new Beaujolais, of course. And it was cooked up as a party idea and then marketing took it to a global extreme by a man named Georges de Boeuf, who was known as the king of Beaujolais. He makes more Beaujolais <clears throat> in the region than anybody <clears throat> in all of Beaujolais or, or France. He, he is the king. And he has he buys some different growers, he has his own vineyards and so forth, and um, makes massive amounts of a wine which used to be the red bistro wine in Paris, um, to a certain set of sillas today. So Beaujolais, because it was cheap and it was red and it went for bistro kind of food, um, it was perfect, perfect, and you could sell oceans of the stuff. It didn't have to be very good. Well, he came up with the idea, Let's. we always have a party at the end of the harvest, and the workers come, and people who pick the grapes and, uh, and, and in the fall, and then the people who press the grapes, and all of our, we invite our producers and distributor friends, <clears throat> and they would have a big party. And that was a good idea. An even better idea <clears throat> was to say, aha, French say that a lot. Aha, <laughs> suit the law. It says, why don't we have the party? And at 12 midnight, uh, the date may differ, it's around on November 19th, 20th, 21st there. And around midnight, we will pack Beaujolais into cars 
uh, with speedy drivers and see who will be the first to deliver the new Beaujolais, the Beaujolais Nouveau, to Paris. And it'll be a big event and everybody in Paris will have a good time. Well, this really caught on. So that to get the first Beaujolais there, they really did have crazy guys in their little uh, Renaults and uh, Citroëns and stuff. <laughs> driving from Beaujolais to uh, Burgundy up to Paris, which is not an extremely long trip. It's, it's several hours, but you just go up one route and bing, you're there. Um, and it was so everybody in Paris was uh, waiting for the arrival of the Beaujolais to vote, which could not obviously be handled by just a few guys in, uh, in French race cars. Um, so what they did was that they would warehouse the stuff um, before November 19th, let's say, if that was the release date. And they would even load them on 747s and deliver them all over the world and have them in storage at JFK Airport or Berlin Airport or whatever um, for release on uh, midnight when the parties would begin <clears throat> all over the world. And it became an enormous, enormous hit. Just a fun idea. Nobody took the wine seriously because they don't have any age. They're barely finished wines. They're barely wines at all. They're, they've gone through a fermentation, and um, uh, they're certainly drinkable. And um, on many years, and I mean, I, I have a bottle around that time uh, every single year just to see how it is. And, and they're, they're delightful wines. Sometimes they're very, very weak, um, don't have much body at all. But um, they're fun wines. But as most things happen, it was very, very trendy for, oh, probably a good 15 years. I remember uh, back in the mid-1970s it being the big burst of Beaujolais Nouveau as, a, as an event. Um, and it, it faded um, over the years. But uh, so now you can still buy it. And they have all sorts of fancy bottles with very festive uh, illustrations on him, but uh, it's just as you, you wouldn't. Well, this is what you wouldn't buy Beaujolais Nouveau to age in your own cellar for the next six months because there's never really going to be any better than the wine when you pop the cork. Um, but as I said, Beaujolais itself is a very, very lovely, charming, good fruited French wine that could be drunk uh, throughout the year at any other time. So, uh, actually, it was then, in fact, an ordinary wine that was part of a promotional scheme that succeeded. Mm-hmm. Big yes. time. Mm. Yes, but a promotional scheme scheme like the Cannonball Run of France. I love it. It's a great idea. It was. It really was. Yeah. And also, this was about the time, it was just a couple of years after a wonderful movie called A Man and a Woman. Do you remember that movie? Oh, There's Oh, the scene on the beach, the camera going around. Don't make me, yeah, don't make me sing the theme song. Driving this, this 67, 66 Mustang. I had a 67 Mustang. And he drives it through these rough roads on, on a race. I don't know, it's not a Grand Prix race. It's a cross-country race, and he's a race driver. And meanwhile, he's shacking up with Anouk and May, and they're drinking wine, and they're going to little bistros and stuff. And so that movie... With the race to Paris and the race all through France, had a great um, influence and maybe, maybe, maybe gave uh, George the Booth the idea. La 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 Another thing is that I realized we've been discussing various things with you over months and just so much about you that makes you a virtual gourmet. You sort of like, you, you exude the part. But I guess the professionalism, the thing that really sets you apart from everybody else, we amateurs, is that you just made the sound of a cork popping without doing that. How'd you do that? No, 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 you just made the noise. You did it. However you did it. I also speak uh, Krauser, the click yeah. language of uh, Southern Africa. Krauser, how are you today? That's it. That was it. Amazing. But, you know, I thank you for the compliment. Um, my life has been uh, wonderful in so many, many respects. Uh, very lucky. But I did devote myself early on, as of college, to mm -hmm, investigating. Instead of these uh, Matus Rosé, maybe I should go another 50 cents higher and buy a real Rosé d'Anjou. And um, it, it went from there. And, and also, as I think I've mentioned before in this show, I was very influenced by James Bond, who uh, was a 
quite the connoisseur, which uh, his kind of, he used his connoisseur, connoisseurship to disarm enemies and seduce women. So I, I had no desire to disarm any enemies, but um, to disarm women was uh, in the mix too. So it has been a good life, but uh, if I would say not uniquely distinguished, but I have tried, and on this show, the topics that you guys have picked have largely been to explain and to clear away some of the nonsense, the BS that surrounds the world of wine, which um, whose romantic imagery has always been there, but people have marketed that, as with the Beaujolais Nouveau, uh, often very successfully. Um, and it's, just, it's the single reason why there's still corks in wines rather than screw caps. The and idea cork is romantic to pull it out is... Uh, you see, there you go again. Um, <laughs> so uh, given that language that you're, you speak cork, uh, obviously, um, uh, John speaks cork. Don't you? Would you be speaking some cork for us? <laughs> but but you but were going to say art. Yeah. So um, uh, every week or so, uh, they get to see a new uh, episode of uh, us uh, speaking with you, John. But in between, there are other places they can go to uh, uh, either buy your books or to uh, read your amazing stories that you produce monthly. And where would that be? Well, if you want to buy my books, you can buy them through Amazon or any of those uh, Barnes and Nobles. Um, but if you go to John at JohnMariani.com, or just JohnMariani.com, um, you will get my um, uh, the link to my newsletter, which also links to my books. But my newsletter is free of charge to anybody who uh, would like to read it. And there's always three or four stories, um, one of which is a wine column, one of, which is a, one of which is about New York restaurants, one of which is a lead feature story. And I might say uh, to be able to read your book, Love and Pizza. Thank you. Yes, uh, we are right smack in the middle of Love and Pizza, Chapter 25, and things are getting heated. And you, Ooh, you offer we love it. The thing we, I really like about your book is you're offering it up slice by slice. You don't have to... <laughs> You don't have to eat That's the good. whole thing at once. I thought of making it between six and eight chapters, but I needed more. So, <laughs> John, thanks a lot. You have uh, you have dedicated your life to a wonderful cause, and we appreciate it. So, uh, it is great information and fun. I, I love the uh, Cannon Wall Run of Paris mm. uh, with Beaujolais Nouveau. It's a great story. It, it now has put Beaujolais Nouveau into perspective for me. So yeah, that's it's, great. It's still a fun season of wine. Yeah, yeah. Good. We'll see you soon, John, and talk about more food or travel or who knows what. It's great. See you All soon. Thanks. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.